All right, well, I'm going to get started. Um, we have a lot of people lining up. Um, so hello, once again, this is the second webinar in a year-long series from MedVR. I'm Julie Lemoyne. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at Horizoners, and I'm also a PhD candidate in Applied XR in Health and Wellbeing at the University of College in Dublin, where I'm an Irish Research Council scholar and a visiting scholar at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver Center at UMass Medical School. The other part that might be interesting is that I've been working in applying uh, XR and applied gaming for about 15 years across many verticals and many organizations. And it is my absolute pleasure to be the moderator today uh, for Dr. Greenleaf's talk. And I will introduce Dr. Greenleaf in just a moment. Um, but um, as we are a new organization, let me quickly uh, describe MedVR and who we are to everyone. Uh, MedVR is a community centered around sharing knowledge about the, about the use and creation of augmented and virtual reality and mixed reality in healthcare. We have adopted the reality virtually hackathon model from the MIT Media Lab to create a healthcare symposium and hackathon event designed to enable healthcare professionals of all types, uh, along with scientists, developers, designers, technologists, artists, and others, and end users of healthcare services to all learn about VR and AR and how this underlying technology can be used to create really unique healthcare prototypes of high relevancy. Um, the Med VR Symposium and Hackathon postponed until June, 2021, will convene about 400 selected participants at the Northeastern University's Interdisciplinary Science and Engineering Complex. I'm just gonna uh, th throw a quick shout out to our sponsors. We have early sponsors already. And if you're interested in becoming a sponsor, it would be fabulous to hear from you. Um, this webinar is part of the Med VR Online program designed to offer a year of learning prior to the 2021 Med VR Symposium and Hackathon. Uh, it's our goal to grow this community in both numbers and knowledge over the year that we have before our 2021 event. So the year of education has been designed to improve the outcome of the 2021 symposium and hackathon. And the outcome is going to be measured by the numbers of prototypes that enter into development or incubated or receive research or commercial funding, as well as the numbers of attendees and individuals that continue to pursue their professional interest in VR and AR. So even if you can't attend the 2021 Hackathon, we invite you to grow your knowledge uh, with the community. And we hope that this series over the year helps you understand and understand how to use VR and AR in healthcare for the good of all. Um, in addition to technical and clinical knowledge, participants in this year of learning will learn about functionally and socially diverse interdisciplinary teaming. So we know that interdisciplinary teaming improves innovation and originality for prototypes. So through the MedVR curriculum throughout the year, individuals will learn about different roles on these teams and how these roles um, actually produce innovat innovation results. Um, so today, uh, throughout the webinar, um, there'll be a running chat on the side of your screen and we have medical doctors, VR experts, and others watching the chat to engage with you. If you have specific questions for Dr. Greenleaf, if you would please put them in, hit the tab at the bottom. There's one that says, ask a question. So if you put your questions there, at the end, as we get to the end, I'll be able to look at those questions and try to cover off as many as I can, as time permits. Um, so without, um, oops, sorry, I went a little too far forward. Without further ado, I would like to make a quick presentation of Dr. Greenleaf. Uh, Dr. Greenleaf is a neuroscientist and a medical technology developer from Stanford University. With over three decades of research and development experience, Walter is considered a leading authority in the field of digital medicine and medical virtual reality technology. Dr. Greenleaf is currently a distinguished visiting scholar at the Stanford University's Virtual Human Interaction Lab. He's the Director of Technology Strategy at the University of Colorado's National Mental Health Innovation Center, a member of the Board of Directors for Brainstorm, the Stanford Laboratory for Brain Health and Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And in addition to his research at Stanford University, Walter also currently is the Technology and Neuroscience advisor on several early stage product companies and accelerator incubator programs. So I, I just, 
Well, I'm not really sure how Walter finds time to do all this and helps others in the field, but I think there may be that he has a couple of extra hours in the day that we don't all get, um, but he's a wonderfully talented. And in this webinar, he will discuss the state of the art of virtual reality in the field of medicine and well-being, as well as focus on scientifically rigorous research and how that translates into applications. And so with that, uh, Dr. Greenleaf, I give you the floor. So let me take my screen down and put you up. Oh, fantastic. Uh, well, thank you so much, um, um, Julie, for the uh, warm introduction. And, and hello, everyone. I, I wish we could all be uh, together in person, but this is um, a, a great alternative. I'm uh, um, so excited to be able to give uh, a bit of an overview of some of the exciting things that are going on in um, XR, VR, AR technologies uh, and how they're poised to become much more, uh, we're all having a great impact on it, but uh, poised to really have a much more substantial impact. And as I'm sure everybody's aware, um, the uh, recent surge into uh, telemedicine has really added uh, a lot of extra momentum and wind in our sails to, to this. So uh, with that, I'm going to start my uh, um, my uh, my slideshow. Uh, Julie, are my, are my slides up currently? Yeah, they're already up. Okay, great. Well, let me, let me start. Uh, okay, as Julie mentioned, I have a center of gravity at uh, Stanford University and at the University of Colorado National Mental Health Innovation Center. But I also try and work with a number of the emerging technology companies and more recently, some of the pharmaceutical and some of the uh, medical device companies uh, because I'm very passionate uh, about making a difference in healthcare now. And one of the reasons that I, I feel it's so important to really address um, how we can improve uh, all aspects of healthcare is because we have a crisis coming up. And it's not just the current pandemic, it's the crisis that we can extrapolate to just by doing arithmetic. It's not a theory about the uh, looming healthcare crisis uh, uh, because of an aging population. Um, all we have to do is uh, the math. Um, this is um, uh, uh, a chart of some of the uh, um, age groups for um, in the U.S., but the same uh, patterns occur really worldwide, and and perhaps even more so in in Asia. The we're very top heavy. There's uh, uh, with smaller family sizes and people living much longer. We now have a smaller proportion of younger caregivers that can support um, our our elderly. And of course, with aging, we have a higher increase in the proportion of uh, really debilitating diseases. Uh, unfortunately, uh, two or three out of every seven of us will develop a neurodegenerative disease by the time we get up into our 80s and 90s. Um, but there's other chronic health care conditions that can be very debilitating, uh, stroke, uh, um, uh, cognitive disorders, uh, movement disorders. And unless we do something about it now, um, with this demographic um, um, uh, condition, uh, we're going to be in a real tough spot, worse than the current uh, pandemic right now, in, in my opinion. Um, so in my opinion, uh, the only way to address that problem is to focus on transforming healthcare by leveraging technology. And the good news is uh, there's been a lot of recent breakthroughs in wearable sensors and, and other aspects of technology that supports uh, uh, better personalized healthcare, and, and that's going to be one of the major themes of my talk. And uh, the, the topic we're all today interested in, uh, how VR and AR technology can make a difference there, is going to be one of the major uh, supporting structures for enabling us to transform healthcare by leveraging technology. Um, as you all know, we're in the middle of a digital health revolution uh, with mobile health, e-health, leveraging machine learning, wearable sensor, sensors, but probably most important, we're shifting the locus of care from um, the, the hospital and the clinic to wherever the patient is located. Now, I, I um, started talking about that sense shift of locus of care maybe seven or eight years ago um, as mobile health started to develop. It's even more true now, of course, with uh, the current uh, uh, pandemic. And uh, that's a good thing because it allows us to do more personalized medicine. Um, 
And digital health uh, technology is not just in uh, one particular zone of healthcare, it's really the full stack of healthcare that's being affected. Um, prevention and wellness, uh, better measurements and assessments, uh, more objective assessments, uh, more functional training uh, as opposed to textbook uh, learning, improved um, clinical interventions, methods to facilitate adherence. Um, healthcare is not easy and uh, to motivate uh, our patients or ourselves to, to do the difficult process of adhering to sometimes very painful or uncomfortable healthcare or boring healthcare regimes, we really need to leverage technology. And of course, we, we have to leverage technology to reach underserved populations that may not have easy access to, to, uh, to healthcare. Um, the good news is we're moving from analog world of medicine, which was in place, um, not too long ago, to a digital uh, world. Almost every medical device has been reinvented and uh, moved from uh, handwritten notes and analog readings to a digital reading. And that allows us to do some really amazing things. We're entering the era of medical wearables where we have sensors that can be we can wear or we can uh, embed into our body that keeps track of physiological signals and movement data and the behavioral data in such a way that we collect a really rich amount of data. And uh, it's not just the physical parameters of our health that we're measuring with these wearable sensors. Uh, we're able to leverage some of the passive data from smartphones to come up with a, a biomarker of, of behavior and, and cognitive function. We can capture voice tone and facial expressions as a biomarker of, of mood state and, and cognitive function. We can use our, our, the motion sensors in our tablets and our phones as we do a task to come up with a very rich uh, assessment of, of cognitive function uh, by leveraging machine learning. So it, we're moving into a new era where we're going to have a lot more tools to, to, to um, apply digital medicine. And of course, um, this allows us to do something quite amazing. Um, uh, as all these um, analog devices get moved over to digital devices, as we come up with more mobile health and e-health and computer-based uh, healthcare platforms, as we collect the data in the cloud, we're able to uh, come up with a really wonderful dynamic system where at one end we have patient-facing applications uh, where we can do um, assessments, we can push reminders, we can leverage in gaming to uh, motivate people to participate, we can do clinical interventions and provide cognitive behavioral therapy, for example. And on the other end, we have uh, dashboards that the physicians and research scientists and um, technology developers can access to look at anomatized data and uh, use it to refine and make more precision medical delivery. So we're really at the cusp of a transformation where we're going to be able to have this very rich data set to, to allow us to do some amazing things. Um, right now, we're moving in the era of what's called prescription digital therapeutics, where we can combine a medication with a mobile app or a computer-based system and come up with combination therapy that can leverage not just the power of uh, some of our medications, but also the power of digital health in a way that's dynamic and connected. And this, of course, allows us to do better research on the efficacy of, of interventions and medications. So that's sort of the background of what's going on in terms of the digital health revolution. But I want to uh, now focus on what we're passionate about, which is how we can apply uh, uh, VR and AR technology to that. Um, as you know, um, uh, VR, AR, what's being starting to be called XR technologies, um, are disrupting many areas of, of our world, uh, moving from the gaming arena over to, to the business enterprise. So changing education, uh, product design, uh, process design. But I think one of the biggest verticals is going to be healthcare. And, and I'll go into detail as to why I feel that way. Um, again, it's all stats of healthcare uh, system, uh, starting at health, uh, health and wellness and motivating people to have healthier lifestyles. But really, uh, every aspect of clinical is, is being uh, uh, impacted by uh, the RAR technology. And I'll give some very specific examples. Uh, I, I try and keep track, and it's sometimes a hard thing to do. I have a database of uh, emerging uh, technology companies that are uh, moving into us. And uh, when I last added it up, there were more than 200 uh, medical AR and VR companies 
focusing um, multiple sections of, of medicine. And, and as a matter of fact, it's hard for me when asked to come up with an example of where AR and VR technology is not being used in, in a particular sector of medicine. Um, we're also seeing a lot of investments coming from um, um, uh, the medical device community, the pharmaceutical community um, into, and the analysts are projecting that um, by 2025, which is coming up pretty fast, uh, medical VR and AR will be a $5 billion market. And uh, I, I think those actually might be conservative estimates. Uh, they were made before the current pandemic. And I think uh, changes in regulatory barriers are really uh, and, and user acceptance and acceptance by the clinical community is, is going to make uh, that number even, uh, even larger. And it's really some of the major problems that we've been having uh, not very effective tools to address that are going to be impacted by uh, XR and technology. And again, I'll, I'll be specific, but uh, motivating people to, to manage their weight, uh, helping people with smoking cessation and dealing with uh, alcoholism and substance of abuse, addressing chronic pain, stroke and traumatic brain injury, um, autism and Asperger's. Uh, there's some problems that we've had difficulty getting traction on. We now have some new tools leveraging AR and, te and VR technology. And uh, there's also a number of industry organizations and conferences that have formed around this topic. I've, I've met many of you there and I, I hope to see you again in the future. And, and so, so excited to be part of VR right now and, and for this conference. Um, let me, because I'm a neuroscientist, I need to spend a little bit of time uh, discussing the neuroscience of how VR um, is, has so much impact, especially in the fields of behavioral medicine. Um, because VR uh, is able to cognitively engage uh, us in ways that we cannot do with just seeing a videotape or reading something on the screen or talking to someone or using our imagination, um, we, can, we can do some very powerful things. And because they're so cognitively engaging, we can activate neuroplastic changes in our brain by uh, stimulating the reward systems of our brain. We can shorten the feedback loop uh, to show the progress that we're doing in something, and that itself is rewarding. And we can leverage mirror neuron systems. Uh, I wish I had more time to go into detail uh, about all these issues, but uh, suffice it to say, um, our exposure therapy has been shown to be more effective than just imaginative and sometimes in vivo exposure therapy because we uh, activate many aspects of, of our brain system. Um, the sort of subcortical pathways, threat detection pathways, response pathways. Uh, uh, we, we've been able to come up with some new tools to shift behavior, and in particular for things that involve uh, anxiety and post-traumatic stress, uh, have superior results compared to the standard uh, imaginative therapy, uh, exposure therapy. Uh, we're also able to leverage mirror neurons, uh, the parts of our brain that uh, look to try and understand the behavior and, and emotional expressions of other people and resonate with that um, by creating an image of our future self that one can see and have empathy for our future self. We're able to tie that into systems that motivate people to shift their behavior. And, and uh, if I have time towards the end of the talk, I'll give some more specific examples of that. Um, because um, uh, VR and AR technology get us actively involved as opposed to passively involved, um, we, we create an experience. Uh, and that is much more motivating and much more um, impactful than, again, just being passively reading about something or thinking about something. Uh, we can provide feedback to encourage the correct um, cognitive processes or behavior. We can make the healthcare experience more engaging and motivating we can have it be something that's done as a group uh, to be able to bring us all together either in an anonymous way or semi-anonymous way if we uh, choose to do it that way. And uh, because we can reach underserved populations, uh, we, we can do this in a more co cost-effective manner. Um, my uh, colleague Jeremy Balenson has a, a, a book that's uh, worth a uh, take, taking a look at uh, and, and purchasing um, called Experience on Demand uh, ab about uh, VR technology. And I'd like to say that uh, VR is also story on demand. Um, 
we can, one of the ways we can engage people in the healthcare process is having them be uh, uh, on a quest for their own healthcare. And, and I, I don't mean to be too simplistic about that, but we can engage people in being part of their healthcare journey by uh, bringing forward more uh, information that's easier to retain than just having a stack of Xerox papers uh, about uh, our healthcare regime. It can create context and relevant. Uh, again, we can have other people participate us on our healthcare journey. We can leverage the power of narrative stories to help people with their, their healthcare experiences. And uh, um, uh, we, we've seen some great examples of that. So again, let me very briefly go into these uh, six pillars of how VRAR technology will significantly impact medical care. Any one of these six is worthy of an uh, all-day discussion, uh, but I will try and talk in, in our time uh, very briefly to go through some examples. And, and I'll start with uh, uh, how VR and AR te uh, technology is being used for medical uh, training. Um, really, the, uh, the whole spectrum of training is being impacted from surgical skills, um, being able to rehearse an operation or plan a surgical operation using VR and AR as a, as a mechanism to do that. Clinical skills, interpersonal skills, uh, practicing the use of specific equipment and tools uh, offline so you don't have to do it in an emergency. Learning to work together as a team by rehearsing how a team can address a particular emergency program. And again, because VR allows us to see um, the patient journey from the patient's perspective, we can use VR and AR to facilitate uh, uh, empathy for the patient experience. Uh, and, and better design the patient experience. Uh, starting uh, right at uh, uh, the basic educational aspects, it's much easier to understand uh, complex 3D anatomy. I, I wish we'd had VR systems around when I was learning the, the spinal tracks. Um, uh, it's very hard to conceptualize that unless you're a remarkable 3D th thinker, which I'm not. But VR and AR technology allows us to step into a complex 3D system and slow down, speed up, uh, move around, and get more familiar with complex 3D structures. Um, we also have virtual patients so that a clinician in training um, uh, can practice how to do a patient interview, uh, learn to how to handle difficult situations that they might rarely come across, and practice their own style of interacting with the patient. Um, uh, we also have uh, uh, virtual cadavers that are being used instead of uh, um, physical cadavers in, in many medical schools now. We can do surgical procedure training and, and not just a person rehearsing this on their own, but having a team learn a procedure with experts looking over their shoulder in, in a simulated environment. And again, a, much like a flight simulator allows a pilot to practice uh, for uh, events that they might uh, never occur uh, or would rarely occur, but you need to be prepared for. Same for surgical skill training is that uh, simulations allow a, a, a surgeon to practice for a very rare event, but to be prepared on, on what to do if it does happen. And uh, again, we can also leverage uh, the power of VR and AR to simulate interpersonal dynamics. And for someone who has to learn how to deliver bad news about a terminal illness of a family member, for example, we can practice that offline and develop those skills of how to do it so we don't have to have the awkward and sometimes uh, um, uncomfortable, very uncomfortable process of not doing the best job of, of dealing with that very important moment of delivering uh, bad news about to a patient or to their family. Um, moving on, um, I think one of the most important aspects of what's evolving right now is that we're able to do better assessments in, in, in medicine. If we can't measure things accurately, then we're going to have a problem with uh, the, the whole rest of the healthcare process. And um, virtual environments are, pro are giving us new tools to do better uh, assessments. And, and I'll give some examples of that right now. Um, many, of, many of you probably recognize what this is. This is an image of, uh, of a plank up over uh, a very high uh, drop. Uh, this is often used in demons, demonstrations at uh, conferences or at research labs of, uh, and, and frankly, I think we, we often uh, um, go too far with this and traumatize people, uh, but it, it's used to show how when you are in a fully immersive environment, how even though you know you're on solid ground, um, your, your, your brain and visual system tell you otherwise. And 
we can create an emotional state. Now, in this case, the emotional state is one of, uh, of fear and anxiety, but um, uh, other emotional states can be created too. Um, it, again, to use uh, Jeremy Balenson's phrase, it can be experience on demand. And those experiences can be used to promote uh, different cognitive assessments. And uh, um, I, I think we're going to be coming up with a new generation of neuropsychological assessments based on the ability to evoke a response by placing someone in a simulation. And it does, doesn't have to be something as simple as uh, fear of heights. It could be something more complex, uh, a social situation, for example. Um, we can do better diagnostic assessments because we can look at them in an interactive three-dimensional manner. Um, we can do uh, uh, measure, uh, because in VR, we can measure movement and do functional movement testing. We can assess activities of daily living for our, our colleagues in physical medicine, occupational therapy, physical therapy. Um, we can do uh, better medical image reviews because we can uh, look at and show our colleagues three-dimensional information in a way we, we uh, were not able to do so easily before. Um, I think there'll be a new generation of neuropsychological assessments. We can go beyond traditional paper and pencil tests. And it doesn't always have to be wearing a head-mounted display. We, we have rooms that we can step into and have people go on a, uh, have an experience and, and study their behavior as they react. And, and I think we uh, will come up with much, over time, we'll come up with a much more robust library of evocative experiences that we can be used at the primary care level to do a, a more uh, um, reproducible um, cognitive assessment. Uh, we can also leverage uh, the use of biomarkers uh, during these cognitive assessments to uh, connect our, um, what we can measure about facial expressions and uh, um, um, other biosignals and tie that in with, by analyzing the psychophysiology to, to do a, a better combination assessment um, of um, cognitive function. Um, I want to spend a moment talking about a project that Lee Williams uh, at Stanford University has done, which I think is a harbinger of how things are going to evolve in terms of precision medicine and using VR and AR technology for, for better uh, diagnostics. Uh, um, uh, Lee is focused on um, coming up with uh, better analytics for depression. And a project I had the pleasure of working with her on was how, seeing how we can leverage VR technology as part of that process. Uh, uh, what we did is we collected uh, uh, neuroimaging data on uh, a, a cohort of 400 people who were undergoing um, uh, treatment for um, major depressive disorder and also weight management issues. And as they went through their standard treatment of cognitive behavioral therapy and pharmacological therapy, we imaged their brains to see what was changing in the default uh, uh, mode network of the brain. But we also challenged them with virtual reality um, to see how um, uh, they reacted through that course of therapy that they were going through and how VR could be used as an evocative experience in parallel with the medical imaging. The hope is, is that one day we won't need a very expensive medical imaging device that at the primary care level will be able to challenge people with a virtual experience and be able to take people, a heterogeneous uh, population of people, and by stimulating them and evoking a response using the VR environment, then be able to separate them out into different biotypes. And once we understand different biotypes and how they respond to a stimulus related to depression and anxiety, then we can send them down a path, treatment pathway that is personalized for them. So again, we're, we're, the goal here is to come up with a library of virtual environments, and we've already started this, that can be culturally diverse and age appropriate, that can be used to um, uh, evoke different uh, uh, emotional states and see how people respond to those challenges and send them down the appropriate treatment pathway based on that, instead of a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, moving on, uh, we have... Um, a whole plethora of improved interventions that are facilitated by AR and VR technology. I, I, I won't have time, of course, to go into detail, but let me give a little bit of a top level overview. Um, here's some examples of how we're using VR and AR today. Uh, we're using it for preoperative planning and image guided surgery. So clinicians will take um, uh, Dyncom images from a, um, uh, a scanner and they will 
in advance plan the surgical procedure using VR technology to do that. And I, one of the things I'm impressed by is that how they can also take this information of the surgical approach, show it to the patient and get the patient's input on uh, perhaps choices that need to be made on the approach so that the patient can say, well, for me, it's more important to um, that I have a longer life. Or a patient, another patient might say, for me, it's more that I have the uh, ability to, to walk. Uh, or it's more important. This, these are the choices that are made, and the surgeons now are using VR technology as a way to have a better dialogue with the patient and show them the options and choices that they, as a surgeon, um, need to make with the patient's input. Um, we're also seeing um, a big surge in new approaches to physical medicine and rehabilitation. There's uh, uh, several companies involved uh, in this arena. Uh, coming up with VR to, to uh, be used for treating strokes and traumatic brain injury, also other aspects of physical and occupational therapy. And one of the areas I'm particularly excited about is that we're finally finding new ways to uh, come up with solutions in the field of uh, behavioral medicine and mental health, uh, uh, psychiatry, psychology. A a as you know, our healthcare system is completely backed up with a traffic jam when it comes to psychiatry and, and psychology. Often people make that very difficult decision to um, to make a phone call uh, to say, I need help with my addiction or I need help with depression or anxiety. And all too often they're said, well, we can only see you in about three or four months. So we need to find new ways to extend the reach of the clinicians and support people who are struggling with uh, 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 psychiatry, psychology, mental health issues. Uh, VR has been used extensively and has proven to be very effective as, an, uh, as a way of distracting from painful and uncomfortable procedures. And we're also seeing interventions moving in to support people with, um, uh, with chronic uh, pain. We've had for almost two decades now uh, ways of treating post-traumatic stress and phobias and other anxiety disorders using a VR for uh, exposure therapy. We can use, in, in a similar manner, we can use uh, uh, simulated environments to help people who are uh, uh, struggling with, uh, with addictions. Uh, we, they can learn uh, refusal skills. They can practice and gain situational confidence by we can evoke cravings with the virtual environment in a controlled manner. And by evoking cravings, we can teach people the skills they need to know uh, how to manage those cravings and how to deal with peer pressure, for example. Um, there's a long list of where VR has been applied in the field of uh, mental and behavioral health. Uh, uh, we've talked about uh, phobias, uh, but also uh, obsessive compulsive disorders, anger management, uh, uh, schizophrenia, um, Social anxiety disorder, uh, autism and as, as, autism spectrum disorder, an area that uh, Julie uh, is, is doing some research on, attention deficit disorder, depression, very long list. And, and one of the things I'm very excited about is we're starting to see not just one product for one indication, but platforms evolve where um, a clinician can go and using the same uh, user interface or the same file structure or the same approach address multiple problems uh, using one approach. Uh, one, one company I'm, that I'm connected with, Behavior, has taken uh, that approach of coming up with a platform, but other companies are taking a platform approach too. Uh, one um, project we did at the Stanford, Stanford Children's Hospital uh, uh, several years ago was to use VR as a way of uh, reducing situational anxiety. We captured 360 video of the patient journey starting in the parking lot, and we green screened in children who'd had that procedure before the service guides. And so the, the patient who was having extreme trepidation about going to the hospital for a surgical procedure or their family members could get a tour of the hospital in advance, meet some of the clinicians, understand what was gonna go on in the different rooms, and much better than just having a stack of papers uh, that you sign off for your patient consent. But uh, it's a real way to have people be familiar and, and reduce the anticipatory anxiety uh, for, for that process. Uh, we've also seen a number of uh, VR uh, interventions move into senior care to help not just with addressing some of the uh, uh, problems such as uh, pain or mobility disorders uh, or stroke, but also to help um, 
uh, provide uh, experiences for people and improve uh, the, their mood by connecting them with other people and having them be able to go places that they otherwise might be unable to go to. And we've also seen the evolution of systems that are uh, addressing a very important part of healthcare, which is palliative and hospice care to help people have um, uh, experiences that can support them as they go through that difficult process. Uh, moving on to the zone of uh, um, preventative health, uh, we have been able to leverage AR and VR technology to uh, be powerful tools for many aspects of health and wellness. Uh, to, as, a, as an interface, as a disability solution or ways of connecting people who uh, might be isolated and, and uh, um, depressed because of that, uh, for grief counseling, for stress management, for improving mood and teaching Brazilian skills, and to leverage the power of VR and, uh, and again, that way we leverage mirror neurons to promote exercise and weight management. Um, one of the projects uh, we did at the Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab was to see how we could create an avatar of one's future self, dynamically link that uh, avatar of your future self to your behavior, but shorten the feedback loop so that uh, we could have people do exercise and show their avatar looking healthier and skinnier and smiling more. Or we could, um, uh, one study we did, which I thought was pretty impressive, is we gave, um, just to show how we could shift behavior by using VRs, we gave some uh, Stanford undergraduates some money, some cash, and uh, said, you can do whatever you want to do with this money. Those that had a dialogue with their future avatar, their future self, put money aside for retirement, whereas those that uh, um, that did not have that experience uh, did not, uh, to, uh, to the same extent, uh, uh, choose to save money for retirement. Uh, uh, and, and that's actually a, a good example of how just by showing, closing a feedback loop and, and having people be aware that their choices and their behavior today affects uh, their future self, uh, making that visual and real. Uh, and I'm always hoping that someday somebody's going to come up with a system where um, uh, someone who's trying to cut back on their use of alcohol, for example, they walk into a bar and their cell phone rings and they pick it up and there's their future self calling them saying, hey, uh, I, my geosensing capacity has told me that you're going into a bar. Are you sure this is what you want to do? Uh, so we'll, we'll see. But I, I think it's a very powerful way to, to connect people uh, by shortening that feedback loop of how their, their decisions affect their future health. Uh, and again, because uh, VR can be uh, positioned as a portable telemedicine program, we have the ability to reach underserved populations. So looking towards the future, um, I think what we'll start seeing is VR being a part of a combination therapy health platform. It might be used in combination with um, um, a, a particular medication, but it also could be used as a part of a platform for providing cognitive behavioral therapy, et cetera. But it will become part of uh, how, we, uh, how we work with patients, especially uh, as the cost of the headsets goes down and as more people are familiar with their use. And as we get moving, uh, leveraging this whole ability to do cloud analytics on, on a population basis and collect more data, we'll become even better at personalizing the interventions that we use uh, medical AR and VR for. Uh, again, uh, looking to the future, I, I mentioned that there's uh, uh, several hundred companies that are pioneering new uh, interventions and assessments in AR and VR in a variety of areas. Um, right now, there's a few areas which have had the most activity. Uh, um, uh, surgical procedure training and surgical skill training, anxiety management, uh, um, addressing acute and, and to some extent chronic pain. But there's many areas that um, are uh, have yet to be really deeply addressed. And uh, um, I think there are significant opportunities in some of these areas. I, I think uh, uh, addressing depression, um, improved cognitive assessments, uh, helping uh, people who are struggling with uh, substance of abuse and, and alcohol or nicotine, um, using VR as an interface for people with a disability, um, addressing uh, autism spectrum disorder. I, I think there's some relatively underdeveloped, uh, underdeveloped arenas that have fantastic uh, opportunities and urgent needs. So let me uh, uh, wrap up and summarize. Uh, hopefully we'll have some time for questions. Um, um, we, 
it's important to realize that even though VR and AR technology at its current price point is, is relatively new, um, our current technologies concepts are founded on more than 30 years of research development. We've had VR in the research lab for decades. It was very expensive and sometimes uncomfortable to wear the head-mounted displays, but we were able to do research. So we do have a running start on, on the opportunities that I talked about. Now, uh, the cost of a VR headset has come down so that it's really affordable at the consumer level um, and as a healthcare platform. Uh, we already have a great example of how uh, AR and VR technology is being used hand in hand with other digital therapeutics for the full stack of healthcare. And I, I think it's safe to say that after all these decades of research and after all the improvements of technology, we're finally poised to move out into the mainstream. Right now, it's the early adopters using the technology. That will change. Uh, so I think we can look forward to a time where we won't say uh, digital healthcare or VR for healthcare. It'll just be healthcare. And it'll be assumed that um, VR and AR technologies are, are a key part of that process. And for me, again, I worry about um, uh, 20 years from now, uh, our healthcare um, apparatus, if don't move now to address uh, an aging population. Uh, we're going to be having some, some even more significant problems than we have right now with healthcare. Um, nicely enough, to um, for that concern is that many of the AR, VR, and digital therapeutics that we that I, I reviewed with you today are addressing senior care. Uh, we have uh, better measurements. We can address isolation and loneliness. We have solutions for acute and chronic pain, etc. So. Even though I'm concerned, I'm, I'm also optimistic. Okay, Julie, that's that's my spiel. I, I uh, hope we still have time for questions. Oh, we do. That's your spiel and you're sticking to it, right? <laughs> um, okay, so before we open it up to, there's a list of a bunch of questions that are showing up. Um, first of all, that was amazing. And I wanna start with the, the fact that you presented so many examples and so many use cases that or just shown across the screen, I think it would be possible to leave the talk feeling like a lot of this is done, sort of the bleeding edge is over, and um, and it's just sort of up to the big companies to crank out, crank out new things. So I, I'm interested in your comment on that, like what's missing, what hasn't been done yet, what are you like really feeling uh, isn't out there yet? So if you have any comments around that, um, I feel like it's such early days, so I'm just interested in your feedback on that one. Well, well, to be clear, um, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, it, it's important to realize that we do have great traction. And we have seen the, the power of VR and AR technologies to make a bit difference in healthcare. But keep in mind that the studies are... are pilot studies by and large. It's, yeah, until yeah. recently, it's been very expensive to, to do research using, and we had to do it at the laboratory as opposed to out in the field. Yeah, so yeah. We, we need to do more research um, and validate what's going on. I think also, um, you know, I talked about how we need to put layers of narrative story on top of the often difficult journey of healthcare. I think we need to get more help with our, our partners from the, the gaming arena and for the storytelling arena to, to help us uh, leverage this power of AR and technology in this way. And I know we're going to go um, through the audience questions, but right relative to that, one of the first questions from uh, from Shlomo uh, Spieth, I think it is, is, is asking about the Uncanny Valley. And um, I do a lot of work with AAA game avatars so that they're super photorealistic, but he's saying, you know, how do you get over the uncanny valley that we've had for all these years, the concerns in that area? And I, you know, I'm interested in your, your thoughts around that as well as the sort of hype topics, right? Like hardware, nausea, vision issues, you know, that kind, those kinds of topics, if you want to comment on where we are there uh, and as well as the uncanny valley and, and where we'll be soon or what your feeling is in that area. Well, it's certainly true, especially with cardboard or cell phone based VR that uh, there were and that we could easily make people uh, nauseous and sick and part of that was the limitations of the technology uh, but part of it was also poor design if you move the world around someone uh, you're going to make them sick no matter how fast your your refresh rate is on your HMD so 
uh, it, we're learning now the right designs to have VR be a comfortable experience. And also our technology is surging forward and uh, where we'll be in four years from now is gonna be so much, we're, unfortunately I'm afraid that many of the VR systems we're buying right now will be at museum pieces in not too long. Uh, yeah, in that. like a month or two months, right? <laughs> but, but fortunately they're not too, they're not that expensive. Um, uh, you can buy a VR system for half the cost of an iPhone. So yeah. it's, um, so, and right, I'm, I'm being, put you on the spot on that one then. So because of the cost going down, do you think there is a killer app? Like, it, <laughs> you know, at that point, like, are we, do you have one in particular to say this is a killer app or killer app area? Uh, I, Julie, I uh, thank you for that question. I, I always like to say that in medicine, we don't talk about a killer app. Uh, and oh. um, it's, um, the, to me, it's, I think, I think applications are, it, it's really, to, there's going to be a, what's the right word, a amazing app in almost every medical vertical where we're able to address the pro problems that we otherwise had it, weren't able to make progress on it. I'll cite your work of looking at children on, on and teaching social skills for people on the autism spectrum. Very difficult thing to do, but with a simulation where we can change and do perspective taking. And, and so maybe instead of saying, um, amazing app, I'll say amazing uh, amazing capability or affordance. And I think the fact that we can show something from another point of view in behavioral that's, uh, medicine, that's just incredible. And the fact that we can have people participate in an experience um, instead of using their imagination to have them be there more cognitively and promote engagement. I think that's the superpower of AR and VR is, is to really facilitate better cognitive engagement. And if I, I may, I've had a, a number of conversations with medical doctors who are bringing up things like assessing someone's surgical acumen and that they can be assessed by, if you bring in some AI and some VR, by the actual movements that they're making and the successfulness in order to be considered uh, skilled enough to be able to do uh, that surgery. And so that sort of when you bring VR and tracking movement together with uh, assessment, AI assessment, there's just gonna be more easily trainable, understandable levels of quality so deep into even surgical practices. You know, So that's an interesting one that, you know, it's just amazing the areas that you can move into in some of these spaces. So, yeah. let, let, let me also address your question about the, um, the uncanny valley. I, I think we're getting much better at uh, having um, our avatars look um, uh, much more realistic and you're right there is a point where it can look a little creepy but I think we're getting better now at um, capturing facial expressions and the nonverbal aspects of, of communication and you know it's not visual fidelity that makes an avatar seem uh, believable it, it's it's uh, a story that's behind that avatar if they tell us something about themselves that personalizes who they are and and again, the nonverbal communication, I think those elements more than visual fidelity are, are what make uh, uh, a virtual environment much more engaging. Where people are very social animals and we, we need to have a, uh, uh, a context for, instead of just a, a talking head on a screen that looks sort of like a, a person. That's, a, that's in a lot of these questions too. So I'll, when I get to the audience questions too, I'll be able to skip through some of those with a little bit of that. Um, I did wanna ask you about the, the cross-discipline teaming um, because do, you've been very successful um, in leading and helping to lead some of the work in MedVR today in the uh, application of, of virtual reality. And do you have any insights to share with the sort of the audience at large around creating high functioning teams to do this kind of research and technology deployment into the market? You know, like the, maybe that's too obtuse, but the work among the team members, some are technologists, some are doctors. Do you have any kind of, uh, you know, wisdom to share with those of us that are moving into the field from very diverse backgrounds? Well, I think I would cherish differences. I mean, it sounds like an overused phrase, but I really think to address some of these difficult problems, uh, we, we need to realize that uh, um, in a sense, um, we need to have, um, uh, teams that are, are cross-trained. Uh, I think what we often in some of the early stage startups, for example, or some of the medical academic research labs, 
is that they um, that they don't have the opportunity to like they may not understand the business of medicine for example they they might understand they might have great technology they might understand gamification and making something engaging but they really don't understand how to bring what they're developing in a way that matches the needs of the clinical ecosystem it may it may save money and it may improve healthcare but if it slows down, uh, the, if the if the clinician or nurse or ancillary care person has to has to spend an extra hour doing paperwork or charging batteries, uh, it's not gonna it's not gonna fly. So I think it's important to really have a cross disciplinary train uh, team that understands not just science and not just medicine and not just technology, but also uh, you know how these technologies are, are are why people would use them and and again, I think we need to bring more storytelling into to the design and development of our of our projects. Something that the the game development community has has been particularly good at. And I think in the, in this area too, like the the notion that with medicine, there's ethics, costs, and FDA approval, and those add can lengthen the time frame it takes to produce a product area. Um, so that sort of pipeline can be different if you don't understand the industry. Yeah, uh, I should say though, for many people that are worried about jumping into medical VR because they're uh, concerned about the regulatory barriers, I think those are changing. Number one, uh, there's more uh, insurance reimbursement and funding in this arena because of the power of the technology and uh, as we show the efficacy that will improve. But also, um, unless you're going um, under the skin or into the body or or controlling a system that goes under the skin or controlling the body, the, the barrier to to make claims, appropriate claims under FDA review is not that high. And I, I think often people are overly worried about that being something that uh, uh, is, an, is a hard to surmount barrier that you need to be a, uh, a mid cap uh, public company to be able to address. And, and then I think, um, early stage companies are able to address uh, both the regulatory and the reimbursement barriers uh, as they develop medical products. Okay, great. And um, and I can attest to that if anybody wants to talk another time about that because I had was considered a medical device with my PhD research. So that was interesting and it was a very, very non-arduous process. It went very well. Um, so I want to give you the last word before we go into just straight um, questions. And the last word on, on this, um, was sort of, is there a misunderstood concept or an insight that you'd want to share? Or is there like one, if you had one last zinger to tell everybody, what, you know, do you have a concept like that that you'd like to put forward before we go into the questions from the audience? Well, I, I think that, I think the one misunderstood concept is that we, um, by, I think in a way I've already addressed it. I think the concept often is that if you have great technology or, or great science behind what you're doing, that that's going to make you be successful. And that is critical, but not sufficient. I, I think in order to really, for us to, as a, well, I, I guess the overarching concept, Julie, is that we have, we're all in it together. Yeah. There's a huge continent of opportunity. And um, uh, even though someone might be doing some work very similar to yours in this field, they're your partners, they're your, your, your collaborators. Even if you view them as competitors, we have to wake the, the market up and make sure the rest of the world understands the power of what we're doing. And so the opportunity is large. Uh, anyone who is something similar to what you're doing is, should be your, your ally. And because uh, there's so many different um, um, uh, pathways to go down in this zone. And we all have to, we have to work together to, to, to move things forward. Here, here. All right, so I'm gonna open it up to the questions and I've got a list in here. There's a number of them, there's 22. So we'll see how we do. Um, so the first one is uh, from Shlomo and several people have, have given it a thumbs up. Um, is there a research that you know of around time tolerance of wearing like HUD on your face? I, I know we worry about that with autism and other people that don't wanna wear it. So, so um, do you know of any research in that area? It, it's a under-researched area, and part of it is because it's a moving target. Um, that what you see 
disclaimers on the HMDs saying, you know, don't, don't, not for use for under a certain age group or not for use for more than a certain amount of time. Um, those, I think, are evolved more from um, reduction of liability concerns on the part of the HMD manufacturers than they are based on science and research. The, the reality is we don't know. And as HMDs get better at uh, addressing the visual system and, and changing how they present information to us based on our ability to handle different cognitive loads by using biosensors to measure that, I think we'll get better at the experience of VR and systems will become more comfortable. That being said, um, we, we really don't know what the effect of, of having a screen so close to the eyes and fooling the vestibular ocular uh, reflex, um, how that affects the developing brain. So I am concerned that, and I advise people not to uh, spend too much time, especially if they're um, a youngster uh, in VR because that could, you know, I hate to echo the the concerns my mom told me to make sure I don't read with poor light, but uh -huh. I, I think we should not um, assume that uh, spending a lot of time in VR environments are, is safe, especially for young people and, and their developing visual ocular system. Now, my own hunch is that it's a little bit like sea legs that, you know, we'll We'll get used to a certain way of looking at something when we're when we're on the boat, and then we're off the boat. Uh, we'll do it a different way, and I, I think. But we, the reality is that's just a hunch, and I don't think we have the science to really understand it. Um, All right, let me move you on. Um, there's a couple of uh, thumbs up. So, on the area of smell, um, and I can just tell you that you know Jackie Mori is on my DSP, and she's got the smell collar work that she's been working on. But um, I'm interested in your comments on that as around smell with VR. Well, it's a, it's a smell is an incredibly important modality that is um, heretofore missing in virtual environments, except for um, systems like the smell collar. I saw a very impressive system by a company out of Vermont named OVR, where they had spatial resolution of smell. So you could be holding a bouquet of roses in your virtual environment. And if you moved it closer to you, um, you would the smell would get deeper. And if you moved it away, the smell would go away. Uh, you could hear a, a lawnmower in the background and you turn around and you smell uh, smell the, the lawn being mowed. Um, I, I think that's just one example of many technologies that are evolving. And I, th But I think smell is gonna be an important part of and a missing part of what we're doing, and especially for issues involving uh, um, anything involving um, cognitive engagement for assessments, I think having smell is going to be really important. So the, the next one, I love this one, is um, about body movement. Can, is, is there any research working around the initial body movement just because we've been working with the role play system that tracks body movement a bit? So, so would body language be considered in this research? Well, you know, uh, the, so our, not, not just our, movement, but language was this question, both, yeah. Sorry, excuse uh, me. Lang uh, language, body movement. Well, one problem I think we have is that as we, um, our, our colleagues in, in physical therapy, occupational therapy, and in stroke rehabilitation are leveraging the ability to capture movement as part of their therapeutic assessments and measurement of progress and to guide people to do uh, a movement as part of their therapy. Um, however, I think as we move through virtual environments, I, I think one of the problems we're gonna have in medicine is that we don't quite have the right way of record keeping and of scoring that data. And uh, I, I, I hope I'm addressing the question, but it's, I, I think as we, as especially for nonverbal communication, being able to say, here's someone's pose, it was a threat pose, it was a friendly pose. Uh, I, I, I just don't, to my knowledge, think we have the best analytics yet to be able to score and, and, and report on, on movements in virtual environments. But I, I know there are a few groups working on this, uh, both some academic groups and some uh, analytical companies. Okay, and, and I wanna tell the audience, there's. There are more questions than we can address, um, but I will work with the team at MedVR to figure out a way to get some of these put forward to, to Dr. Greenleaf. So the next one uh, on the queue is um, more about logistics. There are various points of hardware that need to be assessed. You know, what are the various points that 
I think it's more like what's missing. Um, is there always a critical setting for using headsets? Is there a trend towards universal platforms? Curious if you tried, if you're training for COVID pandemics, you know, I, we haven't really talked about COVID in here. So maybe you want to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about that right now. Well, of course, um, COVID has impacted what we're doing in, 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 in um, several ways, ways that we're becoming much more of the importance of being, keeping our, our devices safe and sterile. So using things like uh, CleanBox as a way to, uh, and other systems to, to use ultraviolet or, or cleaning to, to sterilize our, our systems is important. But I think the impact of COVID has also uh, really dropped a lot of the regulatory and reimbursement barriers for what we're doing. So I'm seeing a lot of investment money flow into this arena and a lot of uh, um, things I think would have taken another 10 or 15 years for us to, to see happen are happening now because of the urgency of addressing um, the healthcare crisis uh, from the pandemic. I want to just, uh, as we end, I think Dr. Greenleaf, can you stay a few more minutes because we have a bunch sure. more questions. But before I end, I want to talk, tell everybody that we have Skip Rizzo, who is just a luminary in the field of using uh, immersive technologies for PTSD and other critical needs. And he will be the speaker on the 15th of July at the same time period. So I just want to tell everybody about that before we lose a few people. So, um, and you can check the website for that. Here's another question. I think if you have time to talk to this one, um, you mentioned monitoring patients in different ways and can monitoring systems have a negative uh, effect negatively in the patient's therapy outcome because they know they're being monitored. So I think this is that like, if you know it's not real, how real, you know, can you talk yourself out of believing something, which is almost the, the bane of, you know, psychotherapy anyway, but yeah, I'm interested in your response there. Well, again, I've seen, um, it, you know, we're, people have different abilities to suspend disbelief, um, but I have I see people put on a virtual reality headset and they're there. And, and really, most of the people in this, in this uh, conversation have probably had that experience of just being blown away by how um, engaging uh, a virtual experience can be. I think we've had um, a long time by uh, watching movies and television of placing ourselves cognitively in a storyline um, using our imagination and VR makes it so much more easier. Um, uh, we're there and uh, uh, I, I think that that will even get more profound as we fold in better visuals, better, um, uh, 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 you know, smell, uh, movement capture, etc. And, 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 and more engaging content. Um, so I, but I don't think it's just a technology uh, barrier. I think it's also a, a, a design issue and, and we're getting better at that too. Um, yeah. So, so there's a couple more questions too. Let me see if we can cover them off. Is there, uh, does the training technology exist for neuroanatomy came from Judy? Yes, there's, there's a large number of uh, great um, uh, courseware that uses VR to, to learn um, uh, all aspects of medical care. And, and some medical schools are switching to electronic cadavers. So I love to talk about this point with you. And the one thing that has come up in a lot of conversations about that is that the uh, medical cadavers, the haptic isn't quite there yet to displace cadavers totally, but the first couple years as a medical student might save the cadavers for the last year of training, you know, things like that. I, I'm interested in your feeling around the haptic uh, aspects of virtual reality and where you think that's going for medicine? Well, you know, I think, um, you know, we certainly can be better at haptics. Uh, there are some great surgical skill training systems that have haptics built in. Uh, for example, what uh, fundamental surgery does, um, they, have, they have a falcon to provide haptic feedback. But I think a lot of our learning is um, more, uh, not as much for the we're, Julie, we're going to be using robots to do the surgical procedures of the future. Uh, we're going to be controlling those robots and telling them, you know, we'll, we'll make a gesture and they'll do the fine work. So I, I think, yes, we'll get better at haptics. Yes. Uh, and, you know, there's also tricks we can do where we, you know, you pick up a virtual uh, uh, coffee mug and uh, it, it, your, your glove, your, your data glove is vibrating along the edges of that coffee cup and your brain transduces that into the stronger the vibration, the heavier the weight. And with 
take a sip, maybe the vibration changes. I think we're going to come up with, the, we're still developing the tropes, the heuristics, the, the, the techniques. Um, if you look at filmmaking starting back in the 20s and to where it is now, there's ways we have of saying, oh, this is a dream sequence that that we haven't yet figured all the tropes out and tricks in VR to convey things that aren't easily uh, conveyed physically, but we will. And yeah. We need a little bit of time to do that. Yeah, I think it's so important to bring up the robots because I don't know that we're the end being that has to feel everything. You're very right there. So that's that we're, VR isn't the only thing affecting the future here. It's well, and things. also keep in mind that digital sensors can magnify our senses. Um, it might be that, uh, sure, you want to maybe be able to palpate uh, to feel a, a tumor, but maybe you should really have um, a, a glove that has pressure sensors on it to do it more accurately than you could on your own. So I think technology is is going to provide, you know, I think maybe maybe that will show up as a sound, you know? So yeah. we're still working on ways to to interface humans to the real world and it doesn't have to, hap, you know, haptics are expensive. So I think we'll, we'll find other techniques right now until they become less expensive. So I have two more that I'll try to sneak in if you have the, the moments. I know you have to run. Um, there's one about pharmotherapeutics um, and pharm pharmotherapeutic response linking it to polymorphism. Um, so for liver enzymes. And so this has got, got a little bit medical for me, but I, I think the main question from Judy here is, is VR being applied in the area of, pharma, uh, of psycho pharmotherapy? <laughs> I can't even say it, Walter. <laughs> it's getting a little too medical for me, but uh, pharmotherapeutics is uh, is where they're going and saying, what are we doing there with VR? So if you can, if you want to respond to that one. Well, VR is going to be used as part of um, um, combination therapy with psychedelics as we move into using ketamine and other neurotropics uh, as part of therapy. But also, you know, I think combination therapy in general. I, I, I doubt if X number of years from now, we will ever just write a prescription on its own. I think there'll be a prescription written and there'll be a link that you download to your cell phone that has information and maybe your av the avatar, your clinician will be there to tell you more about utilization and keep track of how you're doing. And then maybe there'll be a VR set up of, to do combination therapy so that your anxiety is not just treated by the medication, but it's also done in concert with uh, behavioral activation therapy, for example. So. Yep. And, and by the way, we have a talk after Skip's talk where I think they're going to go into replacing opioids with VR. And so we have some really interesting talks coming up for everyone on that uh, that might delve right into that area. Um, OK, so we have numbers of other talks, um, but I think we're going to clip it here and because uh, Walter has to go to another talk. Um, and then we'll see about uh, getting the answers. Um, and I know that we are interested in a survey from everyone. Um, so that's going to go out either in mail or will be put somewhere so that you can see it as well. And I want to give the floor to you, Walter, if there's anything else you want to say based on all the questions that we've had. Well, I'm, uh, I'll just say I'm sorry I was not able to, to read the questions while answering questions at the same time. So I'm sure I missed a few. And Julie, thanks for moder your great moderation. Uh, and uh, Again, I want to underscore that we're all in this together. That in order to move things forward, we're at such an early stage. We need to collaborate um, in a in a in a major way. Uh, I remember when the gaming arena first got started, um, there was just a handful of developers developing for consoles, and they realized that if they worked together, they could make gaming something that would become a, an actual um, business beyond just a select few. And here we are, it's it's bigger than the movie industry. So yeah. I think the same thing here that uh, I, I think everybody who is in this arena is a collaborator and and we should all work together. Um, and uh, I've enjoyed, I wish I could be with everybody in, in a more face-to-face uh, -face way uh, and talking with you as opposed to having you listen to me. And I should point out that my name is not W-L-T-H-E-R, but uh, I'm so dyslexic. I didn't notice it in the heading until just now. <laughs> okay. Well, thank. I want to thank everybody for coming. That Stephen posted the uh, survey. I think in the in the link uh, in the chat. And I want to thank everybody very much for coming. And we'll see you in two weeks, where we're so delighted to have Skip uh, give his talk. And he's 
had numbers of work escape his lab, as he says. So we're really looking forward to that, Doc. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk to you all soon. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. You're welcome. So I didn't turn my screen share off, but you were able to do that? OK, great. Yep. And yep. Uh, uh, I, do you have a record of the questions? Is that archived any place or? Uh, yes. Uh, hang on. Let me. I will. Um, it says stop broadcasting. So I have a little bit. Oh. Uh, I know that we have them. Mm, it's not. So I'm going to end the broadcast. It's not ending on me. So, Walter, I'll make sure we get them all to you. All right. OK. For some reason, yeah. I'm sort of stuck in a moment here with the system. <laughs> I'm glad it only happened now. All right, well, mm -hmm. awesome. That was so awesome. Thank you so much for your, your All talk. All right, thank you, Julie. Uh, we'll stay in I'll touch. I'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Let's see.